Welcome to episode 69 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we learn how the noble prince Siegfried won his fame in Siegfried and the Nibelings. Siegfried was a great and noble prince whose fame by reason of his mighty deeds hath endurance through the ages. His sire was King Sigmund of the Netherlands, and his mother was named Sieglinde. Ere yet he had reached the years that are mellowed by wisdom, Siegfried was a proud and haughty spirit, and brooked not restraint. Great was his strength, and if his playfellows obeyed not his will in all things, he smote them harshly, so that they hated as much as they feared him. Wild and willful was the prince as a lad may be. As Siegfried's doings, complaint was made unto the king, who resolved to set him to work among strong and skilled men. Accordingly, the prince was set with Mima, the wondersmith, who dwelt in a deep forest, so that he might acquire such knowledge of how weapons were made as would serve him well in another time. Mima gave the lad heavy tasks to perform, and kept him working at anvil and bellows from morning till eve. Skillful in time he became, and his strength increased beyond knowledge. The years went past, and the lad endured the burden of servitude and the blows of his elders with humility. But one day he fell upon Veland, the strongest and most cunning smith that was in Mima's service, and dragged him by the locks through the smithy. Mima was wroth, but Siegfried had discovered the full measure of his might, and he commanded haughtily, as befits a prince, that a strong sword should be forged for him. The master smith realized that he must needs obey, however unwillingly he might be. So he drew from the furnace a bar of glowing iron and bade the lad to beat out for himself a worthy blade. Siegfried swung high the great hammer and struck a blow which shook the smithy. The iron was splintered to pieces. The hammer snapped asunder and the anvil was driven deep into the ground. Mima spake with anger. But Siegfried smote him heavily, and the other assistants he smote also. Then the lad demanded to be given a sword equal to his strength. Mima made promise to forge it for him, but in his heart he vowed to be avenged. First, he went through the forest to the place where dwelt his brother Rajan, who had been by reason of his evil doings transformed into a dragon. Mima roused the monster to anger and bade him lie in wait for Siegfried. Thereafter, he returned to the smithy and asked the lad to hasten through the forest under the dwelling of the charcoal burner, so that he might procure sufficient good fuel with which to forge the promised sword. Siegfried seized his club and went forth. He came to a forest swamp, which swarmed with venomous snakes and great lindworms and toads but he had more loathing than terror. When he reached the charcoal burner, he besought him for fire so that he might destroy the reptiles. Alas for thee, the charcoal burner exclaimed, for if thou dost return again by the way thou dost come, the dragon Rajan will come forth to devour thee. The prince scorned to be afraid, and snatching a fiery brand, he returned through the forest and set it in flames the trees and the shrubbage of the swamps, so that all loathsome reptiles were destroyed. Then came forth the great dragon, bellowing loud and spouting venom. The earth trembled as he came, but Siegfried was not afraid. Thrice he smote the monster with his club, and thus slew it. Perceiving that the dragon was dead, the prince cut it up, and a deep stream of blood issued forth. He dipped his finger into it and marveled to find that the skin had become hard as horn. Now shall I render myself invulnerable against battle wounds, he said. So he cast off his clothing 
and plunged into the hot stream. His whole body was then made horn hard, save a single spot between his shoulders to which a gummy leaf had adhered. Siegfried was well pleased. He clad himself in cooked pieces of the dragon's flesh so that he might receive a mead of its strength. As he watched the flesh broiling, he tasted a portion to discover if it were ready. When he did that, the forest was filled with magic voices, for he could understand the language of birds. Marveling greatly, he listened to the birds as they sang. If Siegfried knew what we know, what would we know this day? He would seek, oh, he would seek, the wondersmith to slay. For Mimir sent him to the wood to be the dragon's prey. Let Siegfried know what we know and ponder o'er our song. The wondersmith would fain, oh, fain, avenge his brother wrong. Smite to live or wait his blow, and lived not very long. Siegfried heard with understanding, and his heart was hardened against the wondersmith. He cut off the dragon's head, and hastening unto the smithy, he flung the trophy at Mima's feet, bidding him to eat thereof. Veland and his fellow fled, fearing greatly the prince's wrath. But Mima sought to appease him with flattering words, and at length made offer for life ransom of the steed grain, which was of Sleipnir's race. Siegfried accepted the gift, and then, remembering what the birds had sung, he smote Mima with his club and slew him. Then returned the young hero unto his sire, King Sigmund, who reproved him for killing the master smith. But he took pride in the lad because that he had slain the dragon. Soon afterwards, Siegfried was given arms and armor and became a complete warrior. A banquet was held and beakers were drained when, with loud acclamations, the prince was hailed as heir to the kingdom of the Netherlands. Thereafter, thereafter, Sigmund's strong son went forth to will renown in distant lands, and northward he bent his way towards Eastlandland. On the shore of the Netherlands, a ship awaited him. A great gale blew, and the master mariner feared to go forth. But Siegfried would brook not delay, and crossed the stormy seas without fear, despite the peril he endured. He landed in safety and journeyed towards the castle of Queen Brunhild. The gates were shut and bolted, but he broke through them. Then did the knights who were on guard rush against him, and they began to fight. But Brunhild came forth and bade that the combat should cease, and she gave the prince right courtly welcome. Now Brunhild was very fair and was a battle maiden of wondrous strength and prowess. Many wooed her, but no knight came nigh who was worthy of her skills. Those who encountered her were slain one by one. Maid attendants she had too, and they were clad in armor, and bravely were they wont to fight for their queen. Siegfried saw that Brunhild had great beauty, but he had no desire to win her by combat against her knights or by vying with her in feats of strength. She whom I shall have for wife, he said, must be gentle and womanly. I love not the battle maiden. Yet he departed not without display of prowess, for he seized a boulder and flung it so great a distance that all who saw the feat wondered greatly. The prince then went on his way until he came to the land of the Niblings. It chanced that the king had died, and his two sons, Nibling and Schlublong, disputed over the treasure hoard, until Siegfried they made offer of a wondrous sword, which had been forged by the dwarfs, if he would make just division of their father's riches. He did as they desired, but they sought to repay him with treachery. For when he was given the sword, which was named Balmung, they said that he had kept back part of the treasure for himself. A quarrel was stirred up, and it waxed fierce. 
Then the king's sons called forth twelve giants, so that the prince might be overcome and bound, and there afterwards imprisoned in the treasure cavern of the mountain. But Siegfried feared not any foe. He fought bravely against the giants. Then spells were wrought, and a thick mist gathered in the place of conflict. But the sword, Balmung, was wielded by Siegfried to such good purpose that he prevailed. A thunderstorm raged, and the mountains resounded with dead clamor, and the earth trembled. Yet did the prince fight on until he had slain giant after giant, and none remained alive. Thereafter the dwarf, Elber, came forth against him, seeking to be avenged. A cunning foeman was he, and not easy to combat against, for he had power to become invisible. He possessed a cloak of obscurity, and when he put it on, Siegfried must needs combat with menacing nothingness. Long they fought, and in the end, the prince had the dwarf in his power. Although Siegfried put to death the two sons of the king, he spared Alberic, from whom he won the cloak of obscurity which could, when he wore it, render him invisible. For he followed the dwarf as he fled towards the mountain cavern in which the treasure was concealed. Then did the masterful hero possess himself of the hoard, and he made Alberic the keeper of it when he vowed to obey his commands. The Nibling people acclaimed Siegfried as their king, but he tarried not long in their midst. He took with him twelve bold war men and set sail again for the Netherlands. His fame went speedily abroad, and his deeds were sung of by gleemen in many a hall. A right valiant and noble prince did Siegfried become. All men honored him, and by women was he loved. Many a fair maiden sighed because he sought not to win one or another. But he rejoiced in warlike feats and in games, and his heart was moved not with desire for any damsel. Now, there came a time, however, when Gleeman sang of the beauty and grace of Princess Krimhild, the daughter of the King of Burgundy. In the wide world there was none fairer, and Siegfried loved her in secret ere yet he beheld her for he knew that she was his heart's desire, and he resolved that he would woo her right speedily. He spake to his knights thereat, and they told both King and Queen Siegfried's bold intent. Sigmund and Sieglinda sought to repress his desire, but the prince would not be restrained. The king warned his son that the warriors of Burgundy were fierce in war, and among them were Gunther and strong and vengeful Hagen. What I shall obtain not by fair request, Siegfried said, I must win in battle. His sire made offer of a great army, but the prince said he would go forth as one of twelve knights. He scorned to win Kriemhild by force, and vowed he would woo her by reason of brave deeds. Then were preparations made for the journey, and the queen caused rich and gorgeous apparel to be fashioned for Siegfried and his men, and when they rode forth they were indeed of noble seeming. Sigmund and Sieglinda sorrowed greatly when their son kissed them farewell. Grieve not, Siegfried said, for no evil shall come nigh me. Then rode he away, the noble prince, to share his need of joy and meet his doom. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.